hello, hello everyone, and thanks for staying with us so uh, until the last talk here at Closure North. Uh, we've come all the way uh, from Japan to talk to you, and uh, we're going to talk about how we refactored 50,000 codes of Rails. Oh, sorry, wrong conference. Uh, we're going to talk about how we built a brand new uh, solution uh, using Closure with basically no resources available. So first, let us uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, our agenda. Uh, so first we're going to introduce ourselves and talk about our journey. Uh, our goal uh, was, well, quite uh, ambitious. And then uh, the tools and resources that we had, and in the end, well, sum it up. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm Balin Terdush. Uh, if any of you are fam familiar with the uh, mathematician Paul Erdős, we are not related. I wish we were, but... Uh, uh, it's kind of interesting how, uh, through Clojure and uh, through Lisp, I got introduced to Lambda Calculus, which uh, he contributed hugely to. Anyway, uh, I'm from Hungary. Uh, I've, li I've been living in Japan for 10 years. Uh, I started uh, coding during high school with the good old Lamp stack uh, coding uh, e-commerce sites using PHP. And then uh, I went to Japan and, uh, well, had a brief detour of uh, uh, animation production. And uh, then at, my, at our co current company, Studist, uh, we're w working on mostly in Ruby on Rails. And uh, luckily, since uh, last year, uh, Clojure as well. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. My name is Katsuyasu Murata, uh, I'm Japanese. I came from uh, Tokyo in Japan. Uh, I was born in Kushiro, Hokkaido, uh, which is on the same latitude as Toronto. Toronto and Kushiro are both uh, cold places, but uh, they are almost 10,000 kilometers apart. But I feel I'm drawn, uh, sorry, uh, but I feel I'm drawn here by fate to share my experiences with you today. I'm a beginner Clojurean. Uh, I'm still learning Clojure and English. Uh, please let me know if I, I make any mistakes. It's, it's a pleasure to see you all today. Thank you. So continuing, uh, let me talk uh, to you about uh, the, our main product. It's called Teach Me Biz. Uh, it's uh, a service for, uh, well, in the industry we call them uh, visual SOP or standardized operational procedures in layman's term manuals. Uh, so it's a tool for, it's a cloud service for sharing and creating uh, manuals. It's a great uh, uh, internal knowledge base instead of wikis. If you have uh, these uh, lengthy Wikipedia articles, how to add macros to Excel or how to, uh, well, fill out forms. Uh, in our company, we use uh, our own product and in, uh, in mainly in Japan currently. Uh, many other enterprises use it as an internal knowledge base as well. Also, it uh, serves as uh, maintainable user manuals because uh, these uh, visual uh, guides are really simple for users to feel, uh, uh, follow, m much more easy to follow than uh, lengthy, you know, these 40-page uh, uh, text-only manuals that no one really reads. Uh, it's easier to call support, right? And also, we've got a really cute mascot, uh, an orange owl called uh, uh, Maron. It's really cute, so that's important, yeah? Uh, please appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, continuing, uh, uh, we're going to talk about our journey. Uh, well, first of all, uh, why did we uh, start our journey? Uh, because we wanted to create a new service to link TeachMe with Salesforce API. How many of you are familiar with Salesforce? Uh, Salesforce is the world's biggest customer relation management CRM SaaS platform. Uh, it's very complicated, but popular with bigger corporations. Big enterprise 
a major market for Tijimi beads. After user hearings, we decided to develop a feature to help Salesforce users using Tijimi beads manuals. We produced the features in the red frames on the Salesforce platform. Administrators can uh, register related manuals to individual, individual pages. Users can then find manuals uh, related to their workflows. We had to develop uh, this application. Furthermore, the schedule was tight, so we had to develop at high velocity. To achieve this, we had to escape the complex complexity of both TeachMeBiz and Salesforce. So we, we built the features as a separate service using Cozia. That is highly recommended by Eldosh. Actually, I've, uh, sorry, uh, but I've never used Cozia before. Actually, I've never used my functional programming language before. We had only these resources, one member with some experience. Yeah, that would be me uh, with like uh, two years of uh, playing around with Clojure uh, open source projects. And one member with no experience, uh, myself uh, as a beginner Clojure. And only three months to accomplish the task. The delivery had date has been decided and announced to customers on our company's official website. Also, because another big project, the renewal of our main product for web UI, was still on the way. We lacked sufficient manpower to handle this project. In this situation, why did we choose Koja? As the, op as, as the other option, we considered Go. That, that some of us were interested in. Because we thought Clojure is more effective and has better tooling to overcome this situation. So some of you might raise an eyebrow at saying that Clojure has better tooling than Go. So what, what are these tools that uh, we were talking about? Well, mostly the REPL. Uh, if any of you uh, been there or seen the talks at uh, last year's Conj, the party REPL, it, it just caught my attention. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, it basically allows you to pair program uh, through the REPL. Uh, you don't need to actually uh, sit at the same keyboard and do it. It's, it's a great tool. And uh, the other tool that's uh, really helpful, well, it, it applies to all lists, not just Clojure, is uh, Paradit. So uh, with Ruby, for example, we suffer a lot from uh, missing end statements in the end of the file, so suddenly everything uh, breaks. Uh, being able to match uh, the parents is a cool thing, but you know, for beginners, it's really difficult to get used to not being able to delete it. So yeah, not really. Just uh, the easy mode parody that uh, highlights like this red thing. Uh, it highlights everything uh, that uh, breaks if you delete accidentally a parenthesis. It looks really funny when you do that. And uh, continuing, uh, we have we have these main dependencies. Uh, LF for our web server. Uh, we thought that uh, we might face uh, really spiky uh, loads at times. So. Uh, AWS uh, uh, scaling might not make it on time. Uh, in this case, uh, LF's uh, highly asynchronous nature is really helpful. Also, uh, rated that uh, Tommy Raymond was talking about earlier in the other lane, uh, which is extremely fast as well. Also, mount for managing state and Faraday to uh, use uh, our DynamoDB uh, backend. And uh, because uh, the service is user facing, so we actually had to render views uh, instead of just returning JSON. Uh, we were using uh, CLJ stash for uh, the, that uh, uh, purpose. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we are hugely grateful for uh, these open source uh, tools that allowed us to make, make our journey. Uh, about uh, full speed ahead. Oh, regarding pair programming, uh, 
Do you, do your companies adapt it? Uh, the use of fair programming is steadily increased in Japan. In our company, we had already adapted in, adapted in other projects. Last year, we had a big project. It was the renewal of our main products, whole web UI, that I mentioned before. In that project, we had adapted new technologies. One of them was Vue.js. On, on the front end side, Vue.js is an easy and useful library. But we had few team members who are up to date the latest front end technologies. So we adapted pair, pair and move programming. This way, we produced far more results than by coding individually. In the case of adapting new technology stack, it is very effective. I think Koja is just another case uh, where pair programming is the best approach in such a situation. In our project, uh, we started pair programming. I could understand tricky points and how to overcome them from the beginning. So we got stuck less and could develop, develop smoothly. As a result, we could produce features ahead of schedule. Additionally, we could share ideas that, that would otherwise be difficult to convey and had to transfer, such as uh, where to add line breaks, how to indent, how to name functions. Also, coding practices, as well as design philosophy, habits, and so on. Furthermore, as an additional plus, pull requests get magic quickly. And now, we have a structure that promotes pair programming. Which editors do you use? Going off topic for the moment, in my company, BIMAs are increasing. But I use Atom, which promotes pair programming, uh, sorry, uh, ah, which promotes pair programming in my project. Atom has two tools that are effective at pair programming. One is Teletype, the other is Koja Party Repo. They are very useful. Teletype can connect the driver and the navigator. As shown on this slide, which the user enables Teletype to access itself and share access paths. Teletype can connect developers together. So we can check and code both immediately during pair programming. For example, when the navigator wants to indicate sample code, they can code it directly. When there is no space to pair program, or they work remotely, they can pair program in a separate place. Next is closure party repo. It can function as a normal repo. It can connect to repo servers and execute commands. Furthermore, we can keep our local environments clean because we don't need to install Koja or Lightning. It really shines when you mix it with Teletype. It becomes a pair programming repo. The navigator can confirm any trouble spots in the driver's coding environment, not only on the code level, but also on the level of business logic. They can directly check the result output and error stack traces. Additionally, using Koja Party Repo, they can communicate complicated concepts and syntax. For example, can you communicate parameter destructuring verbally? It is pretty difficult, isn't it? All right, uh, continuing. One of uh, the other things that uh, was really helpful for us is the power of closure syntax. 
as uh, most of you are probably familiar with it, uh, the expressiveness of Clojure is one of its biggest selling points. Like you can't uh, listen to uh, someone introducing Clojure and not say expressive uh, at least two times. Uh, it's uh, like, for example, in Ruby, uh, you have to worry about uh, the significance of white space. Not as much as in Python, sure, but uh, still, uh, where you add li line breaks, when you, where you can add line breaks and not, it's uh, really uh, important because it, it just breaks the code. And uh, it's very not obvious at times why uh, you can add a line break here and not there, why you can add the space here and not here, why certain operators behave uh, in the presence uh, of white space and uh, without it differently. So uh, compared to that, the, the simplicity of uh, Clojure's uh, Lispy parenthesis uh, things, uh, format where everything is a function and everything is contained within these parentheses, you just can't make a mistake because if you do, well, as I showed you earlier, the parody just goes all red, so uh, you, you can screw up. And uh, it, also, there is very little that you need to actually learn uh, beforehand uh, because uh, uh, you don't need to need uh, you don't need to learn the difficult stuff. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know. Uh, macros or uh, records, uh, these things that uh, well. Of course, it makes the, your life easier, but uh, I mean, I don't think I wrote more than three macros in my life so far. And uh, well, I'm speaking here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, also, uh, this, this structuring is probably the most difficult thing that a beginner has to get their heads around. And uh, even that, well, I think it took uh, Katsuyasu like two days to get used to it, and after that, uh, he wasn't even asking any more questions. And uh, continuing, uh, the other powerful thing that we had at our disposal was uh, rated and uh, the ring uh, uh, architecture. As, uh, well, ring's name indicates, it's all rings. Uh, middleware and handlers are the only things that matter. Uh, handlers are the actual functions that return the uh, response and uh, middleware uh, meddle with uh, the, requ the incoming request and the outgoing response. Uh, Ring itself, like uh, the default uh, Ring middleware library, it uh, gives most features that you could need in a web service, sessions, cookies, uh, authentication, whatever. Uh, and rate it makes it really easy to uh, manipulate this list of uh, middleware, add uh, certain middleware only for certain routes. Uh, routes you don't have to worry about uh, uh, middleware affecting uh, routes that you don't want them to. And uh, also, it's uh, really easy to learn and improve. Uh, for example, we had a SRE uh, guy working with us uh, on this project. And well, two, the, two weeks into this project, uh, we were like, okay, it was, we, it's about time that we added some metrics to, our, uh, to see how well we are performing, see when the, uh, the test server dies. So, and uh, he added a health check endpoint without ever written a single line of closure before. So it's really simple to uh, adjust and uh, learn. Also, it's all data and uh, well, uh, Thomas talked about it uh, earlier that it's all data, so it's very easy to manipulate. And uh, because it's not only the routes, uh, routes, it's also the request map and the response map. Uh, it's very easy to mock uh, tests for uh, your functions and middleware. And well, here we come to the functional programming uh, uh, main topic. Uh, pure functions are pure joy. Uh, it's very... Uh, Simple for, uh, sorry. So it's very easy to separate concerns uh, because uh, when you follow these, uh, when you follow the separation of concerns closely, then it's uh, easy to write functions that are really just, well, these are uh, my stateful functions and these are my uh, pure functions that don't uh, mess with everything, anything else. So uh, with ring handlers and middleware, uh, ha handlers just worry about uh, the request and uh, can assume that uh, whatever is in there is a request. And uh, middleware uh, have to return 
a function which is well just a higher order function uh, so uh, Clojure is really well equipped to handle this uh, because of its uh, well it being a functional language uh, for example, in uh, Rails, good luck trying to separate the concerns out of your application controller. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, that's not going to happen. And uh, that said, uh, we've had some uh, hiccups uh, during our journey, uh, not to be mistaken with the uh, markup language. Uh, some problems that uh, we had to face. Uh, one. The biggest that I still couldn't really get my head uh, around is uh, what it actually means in Clojure uh, to compile, what it, is, what it means to when something happens at compile time, at create time. Uh, in our service, we load uh, uh, settings from the environment, which I think is a pretty common practice. Uh, we use stateful mount components to deal with uh, things like the uh, web server starting or uh, the session store, which is backed by Redis. And uh, often it's not uh, clear. I mean, it, it's really not obvious what is it that gets fixed at compile time and what gets loaded uh, during runtime. Uh, so we run into multiple issues with uh, session stores that uh, got copied to each individual route. And so every request hitting a different route would uh, have its own session store. So actually it was, well, quite uh, uh, difficult to debug what, what, was, what was the problem, what's going on. And uh, sometimes uh, passing something by uh, uh, through parameters worked, but uh, not through when you directly accessed it as a reference and sometimes the other way around. So it, it was really, I, I still can't really understand uh, why some things work and some other things don't. Next, uh, let me talk about my experience writing tests. In Clojure, it is easy to code tests and execute them. As shown on this slide, we define test cases using the deftest function. Unconcerned functions are mocked by the with redefs. In this case, the CD function always returns a hash. We check the result using the is function. Koja is a function, functional programming language. It mostly depends on only arguments and return values. So we can test easily by mocking and constant functions. Additionally, the use fixtures function is also useful. When we define the use fixtures function, we can add functions as preparation and post-processing for test cases. Additionally, we can choose to execute only once or each time. At our project, we decided to code tests about middleware function. They are executed functions before handler functions execute in Reddit. Middleware functions get the request hash as an argument. But a problem occurred when we replaced request values to mock values. I wanted to test conditions which change page transitions based on a, on a session value. As shown on this slide, a function checks whether a session value exists if it doesn't exist, users are rendered an error page. In that case, we thought we can just replace session values like the other values used. But in contrast to our expectations, session values weren't replaced. The root of this problem was third-party middleware. Ring has middlewares that can create a format, a request hash. Normally, it is useful, so we can use a request hash without detail, detailed considering. Same as in tests, a request hash is updated by Ring's middleware. So 
it was hard to replace session values to test values. How did we solve this problem? We used the with redef for third party functions, that is, ring functions. We defined these functions so that they return a mock request. To be precise, we replaced the session request function so that it can return mocked values unchanged. This attempt succeeded. Now I know that we can also easily mock even third party functions. So in unit tests, I don't have to worry whether the third party function will, or will work or not. Next. Uh, let me talk about passing data to views. This occurred when I tried to do a few complex codings by using CLJ stash. CLJ stash is very useful. As shown on this slide, we can implement dynamic views, only passing values and embedding them in view files. But if we require complex processes, that code gets complex and long. For example, it is a combination of calculating values and iterating hashes. I wanted to add a sequence number for each iterative hashes. Normally, in this case, it is easy to code by using an, an iteration variable in view files, like this Rails code. But CLJ stash can't use variable in view files. So I had to create a function to return the sequence number and embed it. It may be correct from the perspective of avoiding over accumulation of responsibilities in view files. But I think that it is hard to code it because we always need to code special functions for easy processes. As a solution for this problem, it is best to convert hashes to fit our needs. It is easy if the system has a model layer or engineers have the authority to change API responses, but we don't have them. Therefore, we solve this problem by coding functions to use in view files. We will need to consider how to resolve the complexity of front end soon. And a little extra. When we execute a load test, uh, we loaded 50 requests per second. CLJ stash has a performance bottleneck. We circumvented this problem by using e tag headers. Our application's data does not change frequently. So this is quite effective. And this may be a good opportunity to contribute to CLJ stash. We owe a lot to these libraries. So we would like to pay, pay back some. Yeah, but e even so, uh, well, we occasionally got really stuck and you know just couldn't uh, move on. Uh, on our own, and in these cases, uh, well, there's always the Clojure and Slack, which is a well a fantastic community, honestly, and it's a great uh, a great place to ask questions and get help. Actually, uh, I've tried to do the same, uh, find a similar uh, community when I was uh, having problems developing in Rails, and there is simply no such place. So it's really helpful uh, that. Uh, 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 we can just ask the authors directly and actually uh, real, uh, contributors to these open source projects are there uh, willing and uh, really helpful. So not every documentation is uh, complete or great, uh, sadly, so it's really helpful to uh, have this community where we can just uh, ask questions and actually get help. So, well, thank you very much for being there for us. Uh, continuing. Uh, our results. 
As a result of our journey, we had a lot of things. First, we could release the service in question on April 1st just as planned. It has already ad attracted some new customers, uh, uh, customers for our product, uh, that is DigiMeBiz. According to the sales department's plans, we can expect further growth in the future too. Also, more people in the organization are now interested in using Clojure. At our company, we mostly use Rails. Other project members are getting interested in Clojure as the second programming language. Our journey proved that we can solve complex problems by using other programming languages. And also, uh, that running Clojure from zero to production is possible on the job. Furthermore, the case the case sparked a debate about making making our teams cross functional. Yeah, and uh, lastly, uh, open sourcing libraries uh, is really easy with Clojure. Uh, if you follow the separation of uh, concerns uh, strictly, then uh, just taking one function and putting it into a separate namespace and then cutting out that namespace into a separate library is uh, really a trivial task. And, uh, well, our company isn't exactly into this uh, open source everything uh, flow just yet, but uh, we are getting there. So hopefully uh, we're going to be able to uh, open source some of our uh, libraries later uh, this year. Also, uh, prototyping using Clojure is now a thing in our organization, uh, using, uh, well, mo mostly the cloud uh, code base of our service. Uh, people just copy paste these tiny bits of code and uh, can try individual uh, experiments uh, locally or on uh, Amazon's cloud. Uh, Later on, I plan to create a, a lining and template to uh, make really lightweight uh, web server uh, templates that uh, can be used for such a purpose, not yet, sadly. Also, well, we are talking at Clojure North, and uh, well, it's a huge honor to, be, uh, to have been invited here, so thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please bombard us. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, hey. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, I would like, uh, can you talk a bit more about the party repel and the uh, teletype uh, uh, stuff you did? Did you get into some limitation? Is there other tools you considered but did not choose? Or all, well, right. all, all of this uh, pair programming in the repel mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, since uh, Katsuyasu, he, he literally had, haven't even ever touched uh, Clojure before starting this project, uh, it was, uh, well, essential that we uh, started pair programming, so we didn't really have a choice in that aspect. And uh, we have a Clojure uh, community in, uh, in Tokyo, and I asked around, uh, some, there are some Clojure contributors there who are quite uh, well-versed in these topics. And uh, I was told that, uh, well, there are similar tools for Emacs and some experimental things for Vim, but, well, good luck getting that to work. And, uh, well, last year at Conch there was a presentation and, and it actually works. So, yeah, uh, as for its limitations, uh, it's uh, strictly text-based, so uh, you don't get uh, raw data structures out of it like you might get if you, I don't know, interface with the NREPL server directly. Uh, but, well, because of teletype actually sharing the literal uh, Atom window uh, as text, it didn't really have a choice, but yeah, it, it, that, that's about all that comes to mind. Also, it's really, uh, well, it's not exactly smooth when the REPL server goes, or goes away. <laughs> you have to close all the windows and reopen it and restart the uh, teletype session, but, well, something for something, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, congratulations on your journey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your experience with um, have, coming from ra Rails, from yeah. a Rails shop, when like the whole organization's knowledge in, is in Rails? Yes. And having to learn, uh, having to use a new stack. Have you? Was there any point in time that you thought about just kind kind of going back? Because there's a lot of it's really challenging, right? For a lot of um, shops that are um, that have their institutional yeah. knowledge in one yeah. stack, and to go to um, a new one without a real expert um, yeah. and people just trying to learn from each other. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges? Whether you've thought about just like abandoning it and going back? Um, the short answer is no. And uh, the reason for it is that uh, when I uh, started this talk with a little joke that no one seems to appreciate about the 50,000 lines of uh, Rails spaghetti code, <laughs> it's sadly actually a thing that we had to go through. So in our organization, it's like, uh, do I really have to do it in Rails? <laughs> uh, so uh, when we uh, received this, uh, idea from uh, the product team that uh, we should uh, interface with Salesforce and we're like yeah good luck doing that in Rails so uh, this was a great opportunity actually for just to escape the the mud, ball of mud that uh, we have to deal with and uh, and, and st start with a clean slate so that hugely and because it's a small and relatively simple service uh, there weren't really any architectural challenges so far. Uh, if uh, this was something bigger where you have to consider, well, for example, multiple databases or, uh, or plenty of external APIs that uh, you have to interface with, it might have been a bit different, but uh, because it was a small and, uh, yeah, well, relatively simple service, it, well, we didn't really have any trouble uh, just switching architectures, yeah. Uh, so what if there's like one thing you would suggest someone do in that in your situation like now having look look back on your journey yeah. what would be your top suggestion for a company that is trying to go through that that same journey that you went through start small start small and uh, gradually ac accumulate the knowledge that uh, when I uh, offered that, uh, well, we can just build this enclosure, our CTO said, well, uh, well, A, you have to take responsibility for it because no one else knows the language. Mm -hmm. And two, if it goes up in flames, <laughs> we're going back to Rails. Uh, there, those were the conditions that uh, we oh. got. So yeah, uh, it, it's, it was really good to start with this uh, small service and uh, learn the pitfalls that uh, we can run into uh, with authentication, with session management, with database connections, and, uh, and not with something big where the whole architecture depends on those problems. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Can you talk about, so I know you're, you're mentioning that like you have multiple instantiations of the session store and multiple controllers kind of had it and I know it's kind of weird because like I'm asking you to explain something that like it's weird to explain something if you don't really know what happened and you're still a little bit confused about it but can you elaborate uh, a little bit of yeah I'm just trying to because I'm I, I guess I, I, I can't uh, imagine what the problem oh, right. was so yeah, I'm okay, trying okay. to get a little sure so uh I was lucky to have uh, Tommy explain to me, <laughs> explain it to me on Slack. So, uh, Rated apparently copies uh, middleware to every route when it flattens the routes, mm -hmm. and uh, because these middleware are just uh, symbols, you know, the, the actual functions are passed, and these actual functions are uh, copied, and uh, when you pass the default ring middleware. Uh, the session there is a session middleware included that if you don't give it a def predefined store it creates its own so uh, when these in all these functions get copied to every uh, route and they don't share the common uh, well the common the shared state of a, a predefined uh, sa uh, session store each of them create their own session store and well <laughs> there you go gotcha yeah. Interesting. And I, I was also wondering, so you were doing some unit testing with Redeps. Um, so I was 
uh, it's interesting because I, I, I used to do that as well. Yeah. But now I kind of just like pass everything in, like if something is required, because I've, I've been bitten before by having asynchronous code uh -huh. and I was trying to test it with redefs and that didn't work so well because the because of the dynamic binding. Um, yeah. have, have you thought about doing that before or have you b got bitten by that? Because um, I was wondering in now if that might yeah, be an uh, issue. The reason that we are doing it this way is that uh, our, some of our middleware are making uh, external calls uh, to uh, APIs, uh, Teach Me Biz main API or Salesforce API, and uh, they can return really complex data structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, just mocking everything by hand uh, in one place is is, a, is too much. So it's it's. At this point, it's easier to just uh, swap out individual functions with uh, constant values and deal with that. Cool. Well, Thanks. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for having us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, Alicato, first of all. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Uh, so, um, my question was um, I saw. I, I remember you guys uh, mentioned you use uh, Adam as yes. an editor, and what uh, what what the, what is the tool that you guys use for like code completion and and IntelliSense, for example? Like, is it Poto? Uh, what is it called? Poto Repl? Something like uh, that. But. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is that uh, I, I I'm actually not exactly sure which. Uh, Atom plugin does it, but uh, something is suggesting a uh, function name completion. It yeah, can yeah. do as much uh, as, uh, for example, you can expect in uh, Emacs where you get all the yeah, possible yeah. Uh, parameter combinations right, and the right. doc string, yeah. but uh, it, it, we can do the autocomplete. I, I think that it, it might be the closure language support plugin for Atom. I, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, no worries, yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm like I was paired with uh, a senior developer, uh, closer like a senior developer uh, right. in my company, and then we did pretty much the same thing. Like we have to roll our very critical applications yeah. like in three months, and I picked up like closure at the same time, and I try um, different editors, and uh -huh. and uh, right now we settle with the uh, the Vim uh, and then Fireplace plugin for. The environments, but like we, if we are thinking of like growing the team and uh -huh. and we have to find like like um, an easier way to like like convert people to use closure, like and and because like to train people use like Vim and, yeah. and also closure at the same time is really not yeah. easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we were lucky that uh, the two of us on this team we were both uh, Atom users from before okay. we started. Okay. If it was like, I don't know, I, I was running Emacs and he was like a Vim fanatic, then, well, oh. probably it would have never happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.